in your pat down. And that's the cocaine, correct? Yes. So when LaFleur makes that comment to the bar employee, whether it's a bar back or bartender, he's not aware of facts that he's about to become aware of, and that is the cocaine on the person of Mr. Staff, correct? Yes. considered a deadly weapon? Yes. Where was the knife? How did you remove it from it? It was located in his front right pocket as I was made contact with him. Right front pocket? Yes. Okay. Did you, did, did you ever determine if this guy was right-handed or left-handed? No, it was not. Okay. So this is what has been removed from him already, correct? And you also, I think we're on the verge of you telling also the floor, you may have just told him, that you also found some cocaine on it, correct? That's correct. And there's been some discussion already about a pat versus a search. When you describe for us in your own words, how did you find the cocaine on him? I found it in his back left pocket of the pants. Okay. What else was in his back left pocket? Uh, when you question someone, do you, do, do you at least attempt to find out their name, something about them? Yes. And you had already attempted to ask him his name, is that correct? Yes. And he slurred and gave you a different name at first, didn't he? Yes. What do you call himself, Jimmy or something? Then he said, no, it's Joe. Yes, I, I couldn't understand him. But he gave you a different name at first. Yes, it was what I heard. And the reason you're asking is because you don't have any ID on this guy yet, do you? No. Yeah. 
So in the course of patting him down, where his wallet was is where the cocaine was. I hope so, yes. Okay, I'm going to stop this video. I'm going to go to yours now, uh, just for a few minutes. Um, yours was this one. Okay. Now, you recall Mr. DeRosier asking you a series of questions about what you saw or couldn't see and the distance and all of that. Do you recall that? Yes. You've already told us, no doubt, you saw what you saw. And that was, you thought, some resisting by Mr. Stack. Yes. Now, Mr. DeRosier didn't ask you how fast you were traveling. You recall? He didn't ask you. And we realize you can't see everything on the dashboard in this video because it's partially blocked by the way, you're, you know, where your BWC is on your person. Agree with that? Yes. In fact, as you're seated in your vehicle driving, where is the BWC? Pointed that way, sir. For the record, point where it would, would have been worn on your body if you had one on now. Directly below the sternum. You're pointing directly below your stern. Yes. So if you're seated in a car and you're driving, it sure seems to me like that camera's going to be pointed almost directly to steering. Is that what it appears here? Yes. So you can't see over the dash very well. Is that correct? That is correct. So, and eventually the state attorney's office looked at this as well, didn't they? Yes. And they concluded you can't, you can't make any determination of what you could see or couldn't see because of the dash. Isn't that right? Yes. So at 5.56, back it up just a little bit. And by the way, when you heard uh, the questions from Mr. DeRosier, he was asking you about your BWC and, and also uh, Officer LaFleur's. Do you recall that? And, and we've looked at both, both of them. Yes. Uh, do you have any knowledge as to how if they both can are perfectly calibrated? I mean, do you know if they were both perfectly calibrated? No, I have no knowledge of that. Could someone's BWC be calibrated more perfectly than someone else's? You understand what I'm saying? It's possible, yes. And if you notice right here, this is just a still shot. We still can't even see your speedometer camera. We can't, we can't make out. No, that's all you see is the arc clips. So by this point, correct me if I'm wrong, you've already, several seconds back, have already observed what you told us you observed. Yes. And am I correct that this is why when you came on the scene, you believed that Mr. Staff was under arrest. Yes. And what factor or role, if any, did the fact that you saw him in cuffs, handcuffs, place or factor into your understanding that he may be under arrest? Handcuffs. Is that a factor that could have, uh, could lead someone to believe he's under arrest, that he's in cuffs? Yes. I know you told us earlier that you can cuff someone for safety purposes to question, correct? That is correct. And certainly when you place someone under arrest, you put them in cuffs, correct? That is correct. And notwithstanding that you've admitted, acknowledged that Officer LaFleur comes up and says um, something about 
we're securing him or he's he's being detained. Remember the word he used? Something like that? And, and we'll let it play, but you have witnessed what you thought was resisting already. Yes. Okay. seconds so far, correct? Yes. Once we're done. I'm just going to secure you right now. We're trying to figure out what's going on. That's why. Alright? I'm going to be honest with you. That's why. I'm telling you everything. I'm off to go again. You see something just go in the trunk? Tell me! 
that you picking one up right there on the left? Yes. Right here? Is that correct? Yes. about the transport policy very briefly that I want to ask you about. If you will turn into uh, tab number 31 in the white notebook. Is this a policy that you have seen before, sir? slash detainee, correct? Yes. At the very least, if he wasn't arrest, under arrest, was Mr. Staff a detainee on the evening of January 20th, 2019? Yes. And turning to the top of the second page, what does it say in that first sentence? The arresting slash transporting officer shall. Shall do what? Search each prisoner for weapons and punch them fire to transport. Okay? Mr. Staff was going to get transported, wasn't he? Yes. And he was transported to the jail in Officer LaFleur's car, correct? Yes. As police cruiser. This policy requires you to search someone before you put them in a police vehicle, correct? And what can you imagine are some of the safety reasons as to why you would do that as a police officer? For them not to have weapons or contraband in this place in the vehicle or use the themselves when yourself or another officer. It's a safety issue, correct? Yes. 
And there's all, isn't there also a policy that even when you vaporize someone, they have to be searched before they're placed in a vehicle? Yes. And that was a part of your training uh, at the land as well? Yes. Well, they're certainly not under arrest. They're being forcibly taken to a mental health facility, but they're not under arrest, are they? No, they're not. So when you place a detainee, a prisoner, or someone subject to a Baker Act, the land police department policy calls upon you from what you just read to search the person. Yes. And this is a policy that was under the administration of Chief Umber, correct? Yes, his name was first page. It's not the prior chief's name, is it? It's Chief no. Umber. No. But yet you under do you understand, Officer Goins, that you are being accused of committing a false or illegal search of Mr. Stack. Yes, I understand. And then on top of it, allegedly colluding with your fellow officer to the floor to lie about it and cover it up. Right? Yes. This time I'd like to move the prisoner detainee transport policy, DPD policy 5.6 into evidence. about law enforcement officer bill of rights violations and whether you raised any of those during uh, any of your two interviews, either of your two interviews in internal affairs. Do you recall that, sir? Yes, I did. Now, you didn't learn, correct me if I'm wrong, the final IA reports you received that did not include both parts of the law enforcement officer rights verification the one being that he swears uh, to the truthfulness of the report. You learned that that wasn't included until after the report was done, correct? That's correct. In fact, wouldn't it make sense? You can't raise that officer bill of rights violation until after the IA is finished and completed. That's correct. And what understanding, if any, do you have that the law enforcement officer bill of rights, as it's presently framed, only permits you to raise a violation during an open investigation while it's happening in real time. In fact, isn't it true you have to call a timeout and tell the investigator you're violating my rights and tell them how they're violating your rights? Yes. And some of what you learned about the way your case was handled and the many rewrites and leading out of the verification, you didn't know until after you were terminated, did you? That's correct. So you couldn't have raised an officer bill of rights violation until you learned of the violation after the fact. Is that correct? That's correct. And during either of your IA interviews with Investigator Milan, Lieutenant Milan, did he show you any measurements that were made of where you were in relation to what you saw? No, he didn't. I have read in the second interview, he, he threw out some numbers, like 293 feet he thought you were away. You recall reading that? 233. You're correct. 233. That's even less than what we heard Mr. DeRozier say today about 900 feet. If you recall in the second IA, Lieutenant Milan says 233 feet. Yes. Back. You recall Mr. DeRozier mentioning 900 feet, correct? Yes. Even if it was 900 feet, that's 300 yards, correct? Yes. You've already told us that your train's mar marksman up to over double that, to 700 yards, correct? Yes. 
But let's go with the number that Investigator Milan used, since you were asked about it by Mr. DeRosier. You'll turn to tab 25 in the white notebook. And it will go specifically to the second interview, which is about halfway into that exhibit. It's the interview on Friday, June 7, 2019. Tell me when you're there, sir. I am there. Okay. Turn first to page four. Do you understand, first of all, do you understand this to be a transcript of your second interview by investigator Juan Long? Yes. And we know there was an audio that was also uh, made of this, but this is the transcript. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. First of all, in the middle of the page, do you see where you told him that you could shoot over 700 yards? How can you explain that? Can you see your answer there? Yes. So you, before you were fired from this agency, you told of your qualifications, of your ability to see in great distances, correct? Yes. Even with that information, now turn to the next page, page five, right in the middle of the page. Lieutenant Milan, okay, I tell you, I actually drove Woodland Boulevard. You see that, sir? Yes. And from 233 feet and me driving in daytime, if you were to put somebody, put somebody in that corner, I can't tell you precisely what I'm looking at. And we're talking about daylight. We're talking about what time is this? You see that, sir? Yes, I do. My question on this question, about this question is, did Lieutenant Milan ever show you any photographs that he had taken of the scene? No. Did he show you any measurements that he had taken? No. Did he tell you that he had done a GPS uh, analysis of your BWC for that evening? No. To your knowledge, does the BWC allow for a GPS tracker to know where you are? I'm not aware. Have you ever heard of uh, something called Force Watch? No. Okay. Are you aware if this agency has the technology to know where your vehicle was when you say where you were, you know. okay? Did he do, first of all, as far as saying, do you know if Lieutenant Milan used to be a traffic homicide investigator? Yes. And it's my understanding that what comes with that is doing recreations, and measurements, all kinds of graphs and things like that, correct? That's correct. And here is Lieutenant Milan questioning you he throws out, says he drove Woodland Boulevard, but he didn't show you a single piece of evidence to support what he said to you in the middle of page five, did he? No, he did not. He just said, I drove it, it's 233 feet, and it was in daylight, and I couldn't see something in the corner. You see that? Yes. He's telling you what he could see with his eyes, less qualified than yours, correct? Objections, like the foundation for that statement. <coughs> when you told him, I'll, 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 I'll ask it another way. Hang on. When you told him you could Wait, write. Mr. Wilson. Yes. You're withdrawing the question. I'll withdraw the question. Okay, go ahead. When you told him you could shoot 700 yards, did he at that point say, oh, well, you know, I've got pretty darn good eyesight myself. So when he questioned you and told you what he thought he saw or couldn't see here on page five, he didn't give you any qualifier about himself or amplifier about his own vision, did he?
self-described drive the Woodland Boulevard analysis until June, is that correct? Yes. In fact, he told you he had just done this right before his second interview with you on June 7th of 2019, correct? Yes. Did he give you any explanation as to why he waited six months from the date of this incident to do that, did he? No. And you were initially unsustained on these violations, weren't you? You later found out from the various drafts of the report. Later found out, yes. And when he did tell you and question you in the second interview on June 7th of 2019, even at that day and time, did Officer, I'm sorry, did Lieutenant Milan offer to drive you or have you follow him over to Woodland and question you? No. He could have taken a tape recorder, that's what they do, right? They record these interviews, these IA interviews? Yes. And far less easier than what Mr. DeRozier was tasked with trying to do and clean up the mess to, uh, for us to all pack up and go out there with a court reporter today. He could have easily gone out with a tape recorder, taking you out on Woodland Boulevard, and asked you questions, couldn't he? Yes. And that would have been two and a half years ago when the conditions, even with vegetation growth and other things, would have been far more closer in time than we sit here today. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's fair to say. But he didn't do that, did he? No. He just questioned you about him driving it and what he thought he could see. And he used 233 feet, correct? Yes, that's correct. He didn't use 900 feet, as you heard Mr. Rozier ask you about today, correct? Yes, that's correct. And the 230, when you, when you answered his questions about 233 feet, that was closer in time, obviously, to the incident on June 20th of 2019 than we sit here today, correct? Yes. So is it fair to say your testimony and recollection would, be, would have been fresher back then than it is today? I have nothing further. Okay. Time is now 2.40. We've done the direct and the cross of Mr. Boyce. Do you have any uh, lead direct of Mr. Boyce in light of Mr. Wilson's cross? Yeah, just a handful of questions. Okay. Do you want to do it now or do you want to take a break?
describe for me again what a lesser included offense is? Uh, when, we were, when I was going through that field training, say you had, in this, say this case, you had a misdemeanor charge, you would put down the highest charge in there. That's what lesser means. Your highest charge in this case was narcotics, which is felony. And then below that would be your misdemeanors. So your testimony is that the resisting without violence charge is a lesser included offense of narcotics? That's what also the court looked at or put in on the yes. Okay, so separate and apart from what Austin on the floor may have, might have uh, uh, written, is it your testimony that you believe resisting without violence is a lesser included offense within finding narcotics, within cocaine possession? Oh, I believe I'm going to say the, the highest charge is what, and everything else falls under one of them. You're asking about the two different case numbers, one for, excuse me, two different case numbers, one for 278, one for the narcotics. I can't answer for also the floor, but from what it sounds like, he put narcotics is because of the felony. That's the reason why he asked for the narcotics case number and all everything else that was like fell under that same case number. But isn't it true that a lesser included offense is just a lower charge, but with respect to the same conduct, sir? Like, for example, a manslaughter could be a lesser included offense to intentional homicide, correct? Well, I guess the question is, though, it, it has to be the same conduct for it to be a lesser included offense, correct? Like, someone is killed, and there may be two separate offenses you could charge them with, which is either intentional homicide or a manslaughter, correct? But in this case, it was, I believe, he put down, I don't know, I can't answer for fossil force that it was resisting without, but the number one charge he put on there is possession of cocaine. Okay. Do you believe that resisting without violence is a lesser included offense in, with possession of cocaine? Yeah. Okay. I can't recall. It's been three years. So I have to, that, I have to read up on that. that that's fine. I'll move on for sure. Um, you were asked some questions earlier about whether or not your supplement that you had uh, 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 right out with respect to the arrest was under oath, and I believe your testimony is that it's not correct. Correct. I think it's the same thing I was going to do. Or it says sworn. You said that's for reporting officer signature. Okay. But that doesn't mean that you aren't obligated to tell the truth in your supplement. No, no, I say that. Is that the trick? Is that your well, question? I mean, when you're filling out those reports, you're still obligated to tell the truth, right, to the best of your ability, even though yes. you're not swearing to, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, a few more questions for you. Uh, how much time as of January 20th of 2019 did you spend on the job with Austin? From January? As of that date, January 20th, 2019, how much time do you think you had spent work, actually working, performing your law enforcement duties with him? With him, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that was his only third time on his own physically. Okay. If I'm not mistaken. Was that your first time being out in the field with him? Not that I can recall that. Okay. Did you guys go to the academy together? No. So you didn't go through training together? No. Uh, were you guys friends at this point? No, at this time, no, I don't believe we were. I believe we were work mates. Okay. Yeah. I can't, I can't break away from that. Right. Could have yeah. been, yes, no, maybe. So you say at this time, does that mean you've since become friends with us on the floor? Yes. Okay. You guys hang out outside of work? No. Do you text each other? Yes. How often do you think you communicate with them? Every other month, maybe? Okay. It's more like a, if I see he's had a kid and I had a kid, it's more. Uh, family oriented, not really work related conversation. It's okay. more because you know my son had open heart surgery and I knew he had a kid and stuff like that. So it's like an occasional socializing to catch up? Yeah. Okay. Um, earlier we, we re watched the, um, the part of your BWC video uh, where you locate the, uh, the cocaine. You remember that? Yes. Okay. And uh, Mr. Wilson paused.
paused the video and showed that you found at least one of the baggies, if not both of the baggies, on the floor, correct? Okay. And is it, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll ask the question this way. By the time that you found that cocaine, you had already started conducting a search of Mr. Staff, right? Yes. You had already pulled things out of his pockets, correct? Yes. Including his wallet. Yes. And his keys. Correct? Yes. And a lighter. Yes. And the reason that you were conducting that search is because you believed that he was under arrest for resisting without violence, correct? Yes, I believe that. Okay. Uh, so you were asked questions earlier about a transport policy. Do you remember that? Yes. So it's not your testimony that the reason you searched Mr. Staff is because you were getting ready to transport him pursuant to that policy, is it? Objection. It mischaracterizes testimony and assumes facts not in evidence. I'm just asking him what his testimony is. He said he was aware. So is it your testimony, sir, that the reason that you were searching Mr. Staff at that time is pursuant to that policy that Mr. Wilson put in front of you about transporting a detainee or an arrestee? Do you remember ever testifying during the IA process with respect to that delayed police department policy? No. Isn't it true that the first time that you have any real memory of that policy is while you're preparing for today's testimony and Mr. Wilson put it in front of you? No, because we had a firm requirement to read all the policies on the TV. Okay. So no, it wouldn't be the first time until after today. I'm talking about you have a specific memory where you could have told me that that was a delayed police department policy. No, we've always had it. I remember that policy. Okay. But it's not your testimony that the reason you were searching Mr. Staff is because you were trying to follow that policy, is it? No. And it was because you believed that he was under arrest and you believed you were conducting a search in his hands, correct? Yes. Okay. That's all that I have. I have just a brief recross. Go ahead, Mr. Wilson. Yeah. I'm going to pick up where Mr. DeRosier finished. If you just answered his question that you said that the policy, the transport detainee policy, which is now in the evidence as Exhibit 31, was not factoring into your mind, it was because you thought he was already under arrest, correct? That's correct. But if he was under arrest, this policy was going to come into effect at some point, correct? That's correct. Because he wasn't getting in your vehicle, your police cruiser, or Officer LaFleur's cruiser without being searched, was he? That's correct. And why, I mean, so you knew that that policy had to be applied before he got in the cruiser, correct? That's correct. So regardless of the sequence of when you thought about that policy, you had been trained on the Deland Police Department prisoner detainee transport policy, is that correct? That's correct. In fact, didn't you say you have to read these policies and acknowledge reading them and receiving them? Yes. And this policy was dated, date of issue, 10-12-18, effective date 10-12-18. You see that? Turn to tab 31. Yes, I see the dates. So this policy got issued within two and a half months by Chief Umberger that expressly calls for the transporting officer shall thoroughly search each prisoner for weapons and contraband prior to transport. This applies to all transports, correct? That is correct. So regardless of whether you were thinking about this policy in terms of you said you thought he was under arrest, and that was what was factoring into your mind is why you were doing the search, correct? That's correct. He was going to get searched anyway before he put his butt in one of those police cruisers, wasn't he? Yes. Whether it was your vehicle or LaFleur's, he was going to be searched because that's what Chief Umberger wanted in a Deland Police Department policy, correct? Yes. He didn't want anyone getting in a police cruiser that had not been searched by stroke of his pen, correct? That's correct. Nothing further. Okay. I have no questions, Mr. Goins. Ms. Lee, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Now two Thank you. 